The thing that I want you to know about in addition to all of your good stuff he does is Tony is actually in charge of strategy for this organization. So he leads a regular strategy call. His job is to tie and constantly keep our organization out in front of where it's going, which is a challenge given an organization that grows as fast as this. But also what that means is, is when you have those thoughts that you want to tell me that we don't know what we're doing, we don't know where we're going, you can tell Tony that now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what to you can tell Tony he's in charge of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of things we want to uh, get to this morning. Um, we are a relationship-based organization, and so we want to work on that a little bit. Uh, we have some very practical kind of work we want to do on developing ourselves as leaders, both in terms of being uh, liaisons and group leaders and how we work in our chapters. Um, we also want to do some work on, um, you know, what do we learn from people who do the impossible? So one of the things that I think we should be interested in terms of leadership, what about the people who did the things that couldn't be done? So I found it fascinating reading about the Wright brothers a few years ago. Um, you know, clearly people who did the impossible, right? Uh, and what we could extract from that. The focus part was kind of simple because that's all they did six days a week. They didn't, they didn't, they just did fly. But one of the things I found really interesting is how much time they spend mimicking birds. So the people that saw them thought they looked like a couple of lunatics because they used to stand up and they were in there like moving their arms and they would see how the birds adjusted to the change of the air currents and how they dealt with things. Because one of the things they knew was they, if they were going to fly, they were going to have to actually succeed what happened. And so I kind of think of that like our practice and our laser talks. Uh, we're not going to use the right way for this one. We're going to see what we can learn from the Shackleton expedition to uh, South Pole. Because they should have died a whole bunch of times and they didn't. So can we learn things that are the things that we can apply to our work from the people who actually pulled off the impossible? So anyway, we've got a lot of stuff we want to get to. Before that, we do a special treat, which is we always like to kind of give you sneak previews of things that the rest of the organization doesn't have yet. And so Leslie Baby, our marketing director, has a couple things that are co coming to action, right, Leslie? Thank you. Okay. Social media. 
media um, to share. And so the first thing that we'll be launching with is a video that I'm about to show you, which I guess is Welcome to the far middle. That delightful light space between the far left. Namaste. And the far right. How are you? Um, so I'm targeting one. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so we are a relationship-based organization. Everything we do is based on how we're on relationship uh, and create. And so what I'm going to want to do is take 15 minutes this morning, and I want you to go introduce yourself to people you don't know. Don't take 15 minutes just on one person, but don't talk to people you already know, you know all about them. And you can talk about whatever you want. You can talk about what you do at CCL, you can talk about your family, you can talk about who you think is going to win the football games tomorrow. You literally, it's completely up to what you're talking about. But what we want to do is make sure that the people that you don't already know well, that you're starting to get to know them. We'll give you heads up about every three minutes, asking you to move on if you have a change for the person. But please take the next 15 minutes. Go find the people you don't know and start to find out about them, ask questions about them, be curious, tell them a little bit about yourself. And we'll give you one in 10 three minutes. Go ahead, please. Somebody of CCL's leaders in the room, because every volunteer here is a leader, especially the you know, people taking on the roles of uh, group leader, liaison, leading various teams in your chapter. And so, um, what I'm going to do today, we're going to take a, you know, have our 45 minutes here to, to work on, like, capacity building for chapters and for your teams. And I'm working inspired by something from the Ellie Sparks, our field director, has been putting together, which is, she calls the Five Levers Workshop. And so, as you all know we talk about five levers of political will in terms of you know lobbying, media, grassroots outreach, grasshopper engagement, chapter development. And she put together a workshop that can, you know, sort of is the next step after you've done the climate advocacy training or a group start workshop and you want to take your group, you've been working for a while and you want to take it up to the next level, there's this workshop now that state coordinators and regional coordinators and some others can give to your chapter that can you know, build your organizational capacity, uh, you know, build your chapter's ability to, to function as a chapter and to work on these different uh, levers. And so, the exercises we're going to do here today are not actually, um, but one of them is inspired by um, Ellie's workshop and the rest are uh, more loosely inspired by it, but um, if you do want to find out more about the workshop that's available, you can go to cclusa.org slash five dash letters. And there's, and so, be able to either look at the syllabus and try and just go in and give it to your people yourself, or you can uh, get someone who's already been trained to give it to one of our trainers. So, um, so what I want to do today is some small group work. Um, so, so we're gonna we're talking about building capacity. So uh, we're gonna do some work in small groups. And what I want to do is uh, eat all together in groups of, I was thinking four or five, but given the auditorium, you know, if three is what you can do, that's fine. Um, but what I want to do is get people from different chapters talking to each other. Because there's so much wisdom in this room. So many of us, you know, there's people here who have been chapter leaders for, you know, five, ten years. And so, like, you know, how can we share that knowledge as well as uh, sharing what our challenges are right now? So my, my ideal case is that you can talk with someone from, talk with a group where you're with people who are from different size chapters. So let me just get a quick show of hands. How many people here, uh, your chapter meetings are uh, between 10 and 30 people on a regular basis? Okay, great. And how many people here have more than 30 people come to their chapter meetings? Okay. Now, how many are from smaller chapters where, you know, less than 10 come to their chapter meetings? No shame, that's great. Perfect. So just take a, take a look around and, and think about trying to get together with some people who are in chapters that are different sizes than yours. Because I think there's so much that can be shared across that. We're going to do some other exercises later that where you might share with people who have this uh, more similar experiences uh, to your chapter. Um, and so then, so we're going to do um, two questions. And the first one is, um, you know, what is something that your chapter has done to build its capacity? 
And so when I mean building capacity, I mean, you know, we were a certain size and then things we started growing and we couldn't handle it and so we had to change something to make, make it so we can handle it more people. Or we were only getting so much done and then we decided to do things a different way and then we got more stuff done. <laughs> That's sort of, you know, capacity building. So, um, just something, and that could be something you've done this week or this year, or it could be something you did when you were, you know, a five-person chapter and you, you helped get to ten people. Um, so I'm trying to just, you know, within your group, share some of those experiences. And then we're also going to ask, uh, after that, we're going to ask questions about what kind of challenges your chapter um, has that others might be able to give you advice on. But we're going to start with this question of what has your chapter done to, to build capacity. Have any questions before? Back here, one question. Oh, I watched that website again. I saw the previous. Oh, yeah. Sure, we can uh, get there. So, cclusa.org slash five dash letters. Yes? Okay, we'll do that again. Yeah, okay. Um, so the question you're going to be uh, working on is what is something your chapter has done to build this capacity? So again, let's, let's see hands of people in the sort of mid-sized chapters, 10 to 30 people that you're meeting regularly. Okay. Now you all can just raise your hands. But look at the people who aren't raising their hands. <laughs> so those are the people you want to talk to. And I'll just, and we'll just leave it at that. And so, like, so the mid-sized uh, chapters, like look for, look for someone from a larger chapter or a smaller chapter. Ideally, you can put them all in maybe one of each. Maybe you can get four people together. And I recognize this. Stand up. Walk around. Ooh, find new people to talk to. Because I'm going to want, during each exercise, we're going to try and talk with different people. Oh, you want like a little tug of war or like a red rover, red rover? OK, sure. Sure. Oh, okay. I get this. Okay, if you're in a if you're in a small chapter, hold up hold up one finger, and if you're in a medium sized chapter, hold up two fingers, and if you're in a big chapter, hold up three. Now get up and make sure that your group has at least one person from each. If you can do that, then that's magic. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks everyone. That was really great to see see people chatting so excitedly. I think there was a lot of uh, good information shared there. So one thing I want to encourage you to do is Remember the names of the people you just talked to. These are your people that you could ask advice for and reach out to when you're, you know, so, you know, it doesn't have to end after this, you know, 15 minute session. You can reach out to these other group leaders when you have questions or other liaisons or other leaders in, in CCL. Okay, so I want to shift a little bit. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, one of the exercises that Ellie does in her Five Lovers is an agenda setting exercise. So this is something that every chapter needs to do is figure out how to set their agendas for their, um, for their meetings. And so one of the things that, um, there's things that I try to think about when I'm setting the agenda for our chapter meeting and sort of making sure that like, we get a little bit of a mixture of different things. Um, so we try to make sure that we mix up the format so that there are some times when someone's presenting, sometimes when there's a full group discussion, sometimes when there's small groups, sometimes when you're talking in pairs, like a laser talk or a communications exercise. And we also try and make sure we're mixing up the content. Like we try and make sure that every meeting has appreciations, some uh, sometimes learning, something that gets people into action. Uh, sometimes there's discussions, sometimes decisions. We don't, we don't hit all of these every single time, but we try and think about how the content balances as well as how the format balances. And so these are just some things that I think about, and you know, there's things that you might want, you know, that you, I'm sure you do differently, and when you're setting your agenda and how you're you're thinking about things. So again, there's going to be a chance to share that wisdom. So what I want to do now is shift the groups a little bit uh, because I want every group to have six people in it, and. 
Um, so if you're in too small of a group, you might have to split up and join other groups, or you might move around just so you're with different people. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that you're like the steering, steering committee for your chapters. So one of you is going to get to be the group leader, and I'm going to make sure that whoever's in the smallest group, you get the first choice. So if you want to be the group leader in this scenario, you get to be that. If you want to be uh, one of the team leaders for a lever, then you get to be that. No pressure, but you get to choose choose your role first. So there's going to be one. One of you is going to take on the imaginary role of or the group leader of this imaginary chapter. And then one of you is going to be the lobbying team lead. One of you is going to be the media team lead. One of you is going to be the grassroots outreach. One is grass tops. And one is the chapter development uh, team lead. So you're going to quickly take on these roles, and then you're going to decide we're a chapter of, you know, let's say we're 15 people, you know, um, in general, just so that you all know that you're on the same page of what kind of meeting you're going to be running. And then plan your plan your meeting, plan your agenda. What are you going to do at your chapter meeting? And um, obviously, it's an imaginary chapter. Don't get too caught up in the details. We don't need any fist fights or anything like that, or you know, the details, but. Um, if you, and if you want to look at the action sheet for, for January, you're welcome to. I provided a URL. But you all, many of you just had a chapter meeting. You sort of know what kind of action CCL normally does at, at our chapter meetings. But just, this is just to get people um, into, the, into the flow of like what it would look like to plan your chapter agenda as a team. Because not all chapters have, have this capacity to do this yet. They don't have enough people or they have a different structure, but just, you know, this is the exercise that LA takes people through, so I want to see how this works for you all now. So find your group of six, take on, uh, take on the different roles, and whoever's the group leader, you're in charge of wrangling an agenda out of this group of six. Hopefully they won't be too hard on you. So uh, you'll have, again, about eight minutes to do this. Okay, keep on raising those hands as you're ready. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I know you might not have uh, gotten the full-fledged agenda, you know, written up there with all the details, but I hope that that exercise was uh, was useful to you all. Okay, so now we're gonna um, do one more exercise, and we're gonna break up into different groups this time. So what I'm gonna do is. Um, so we're in a new position now than we have ever been in the past, where we have a bill in Congress. And so um, there are, with many sponsors, there's 75 sponsors to the Energy Innovation Act. And so what I want to do is have, um, if your chapter works primarily in a district where uh, your member of Congress is already a sponsor, you're going to come over here. And if your uh, member of Congress is a Republican, then they're gonna go over here. I don't think there's any overlap between those two in this region of the country. Um, and then if your um, member of Congress is neither a sponsor nor a Republican, then you're gonna be in this group in the middle. And if you have worked with more than one member of Congress, then I'm gonna let you decide which of those three groups uh, to go to. So let's do that movement real quick. Okay, let's make some space down here in front, and let's bring your attention up here. Okay, so what I want to do is, we're going to, again, we're going to break up into groups of around five, but what I want to do is, you know, people who, uh, so, you know, you have shared experience here, so people who have, your member of Congress is already a sponsor, you know, can break up into groups of five, uh, people with Democrats who aren't sponsors can break up into groups of five. Uh, people with Republican um, sponsors or Republican members of Congress can can break up into groups of five. And the questions are, you know, what is your group doing to further the relationship with your member of Congress? 
and what is your group doing to build political will locally and nationally? And I want to um, steal a little bit from Sam Daly Harris's work to sh um, just uh, talk about the champion scale that he talks about. Uh, hopefully, I'll get this right since he's here in the room. Um, <laughs> um, that you know, you can that that a, a member of Congress might start. You can might be anywhere on this on this. Uh, on this list, and so they might be opposed, they might be neutral, they might be a supporter, um, they might be an advocate, where they're actually um, not just saying, yes, I support this thing, but they're actually going out and doing work to, to build support for it. Uh, they could be even a leader or a spokesperson, you know, like Ted Deutsch is, our, is you know, obviously a, a spokesperson and leader on our, on our bill, um, and the champion is someone who's like, I mean, maybe Ted Deutsch is actually a champion, since he's out there like, you know, beating the bushes, trying to get more people onto the, onto there. So think about where your members of Congress are on this, and think about that that almost no matter where they are, there's room to move them up uh, the championship scale. So just because you've got someone who's a supporter doesn't mean that there isn't room to keep moving things up. That's not the only way to continue building relationships, but that is one one factor that you can consider. So again, find, find groups of five, and then we're going to look at these questions of what, are your, what is your group doing to further the relationship and what is your group doing to build political will locally and nationally? And just share that with each other. Okay, so you'll have about eight minutes to do that as well. Okay, so there's a few things that I'm hoping that you can take away from this, uh, from this session, from these exercises. Um, as I mentioned earlier, here's, here's, here's a few takeaways. Um, one, there's a lot of other people just like you doing the same kinds of things and they are your friends and they are support people and they are people you can ask advice from. So hopefully you do remember some of each other's names and you think next time when you're struggling with a question of how do we want to do this in your chapter, you can reach out to some of your other uh, NorCal allies. So just, yeah, just remember that you've got peers out there, that you're not alone in this, that we're all, you know, it's a team sport, and you've got allies that you can, can draw on. And then another thing that I'm hoping you can take away is just that there's a lot of different ways to do this, that hopefully you heard from different people that, you know, some of them reinforcing things that you already do, you're like, yeah, we do that too. That's just how my group does it, that's great. And some things where you can say, oh, I had never thought about that, and hopefully there's things you can take back to your chapter and say, you know, we should do this. I heard from the from that other chapter that they are doing this thing. We should do that too. So I'm just hoping that there are some takeaways from this. And if you have, um, if you brought up questions or you want to share anything with me, happy to talk during lunch or later today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Mark. Here you go. Yeah, we are lucky to have Tony as a resource, aren't we? Remind me that one, next time you annoy me, Tommy. <laughs> okay, so we want to. Can you guys pull up the next PowerPoint from the back of the room? Uh, so, as I said at the start of the session, one of the things we want to do is look at uh, where people have done the impossible, dealt with impossible circumstances, and persevered, and see if there's things that we can extract from them uh, for what we're doing. Uh, I think some things apply pretty directly. So, this is Ernest Shackleton's story, it teaches us leadership and also how to fight climate change. And this was actually a piece written by Tim Jarvis, who is an environmental explorer. He says, sometimes we have to look to the past to find inspiration for how to impact the future. One of the best places to look for leadership is in the explorers who have persisted through the most dire of situations. And there are few pioneers with more pluck than Sir Ernest Shackleton. Shackleton's story of keeping 27 frostbitten men alive for more than 15 months in Antarctica is now taught in many of the world's leading management schools. Yale, Harvard, Cambridge, Wharton, you name it. NASA even has a Shackleton training program. Most people use Shackleton's story to teach teams about leadership, but I think it can teach us how to fight climate change. It's one thing to read the accounts of explorers' death-defying pilgrimage or study them in university, but it's quite another to learn from their experience yourself. I had already relived the journey of one seemingly impossible Antarctic odyssey, that of Douglas Mawson, who was the lone survivor of a 1911 expedition to the South Pole, 
where he was accused of cannibalizing his fellow explorers. So what was one more? This is either a very brave man or a very stupid man, I think. <laughs> Shackleton's story. I retraced the 1940 mission of Sir Ernest Shackleton, who went down to the Antarctic with the goal to cross it from one side to the other. He left on the eve of World War I in his ship, the Endurance, for a 2,700 kilometer, 1,680 mile journey across the continent. As you're probably aware, everything went wrong. The ship got stuck in pack ice, which closed in around its hole. Even though it was a very strong vessel, in the end, the ice crushed the hole, and the only thing holding the ship together was the ice tightly packed around it. The men were stuck in the vessels for 10 months, surviving off penguin meat and seal blubber. Then for, for further five months, they lived a very precarious existence on the sea, in, on the sea ice in camps, living under three upturned life worlds from the main expedition ship. They were all going to die. Everyone knew it. Shackleton knew it. They knew it. But somehow, his leadership got them through it. The key, key takeaway for me is the fact that Shackleton had what we now call emotional intelligence. He knew that teams are made up of individuals, and every individual is different. If you want to have a group of people pull as one to achieve a singular goal, in their case, survival, then you need to tell each person a slightly different version of the story. The same can be said for climate change. When we approach the issue, we, all, we often have a one-size-fits-all fear and guilt-based messaging system. But if we have to be careful about the message we use and get creative about the messaging to get the issue across. The UN is very different from the US in terms of what influences them compared to a country like India with 300 million people in rural poverty. Or Vanuatu, probably pronounced wrong, which is under threat of being submerged in the same way Shackleton's ship was. That's not where the similarities start. In Shackleton's case, the ship goes on, the ship goes down. They spend 10 months on the ship, five months on the pack ice, then the men get into three lifeboats and paddle for their lives. Their nearest piece of line they can find is a jagged rock called Elephant Island. They fall ashore and they celebrate. As far as they've concerned, they've saved themselves. The Shackleton knows that they're all going to die there. Nobody's going to be able to find them there. The only hope for them is to get the most seaworthy boat and attempt a journey across the Southern Ocean to the nearest habitable place, a little dot in the Southern Ocean, some 1,500 kilometers from Elephant Island, South Georgia. Against all odds, two storms, one massive hurricane, and navigating using a sextant on a 23-foot long pitching boat with no keel in the roughest ocean in the world, often in complete darkness, seeing the sun twice to navigate by, they managed to find a little dot in the ocean. If they missed it, the next land was 4,500 kilometers further to Nibiria, close enough, whatever. And obviously they'd be dead. <clears throat> to further their terrible luck, they arrived on the southern side of the island. The trouble was, the whaling stations that were their salvation were on the north side of the island, and in between them was a mountain that had never been climbed. They had no masks, no climbing gear, and no tents. Three of the men had been incapacitated due to the trials and tribulations of their journey, leaving only Shackleton and two others to complete the journey. So what did they do? They pushed nails through the soles of their boots for grip and did the first crossing of the mountains of South Georgia in a time that modern mountaineers have been unable to replicate even today. They reached the station, raised the alarm, and saved the 22 men they left behind on Elephant Island. It was a truly remarkable journey. Replicating Shackleton's journey, so I decided to give it a go myself. <laughs> okay, this doesn't have a picture of the boat, I'm sorry about that. This is the boat, the Alexander Shackleton, named after the granddaughter of Sir Ernest Shackleton, who asked me to, do, to replicate her grandfather's mission. The idea was simple. Suffer as they did, wear old clothing, be large, <laughs> operate a boat with no keel in the roughest ocean of the world, with no GPS and no emergency supplies of Mars bars, nothing. Life in the boat. It's not for everyone. It's cold, unpleasant, dangerous journey across the Southern Ocean with no modern equipment, wearing cotton smocks designed for a journey across the windiest continent on the world, not the sea. This ocean is only about 1 degree centigrade, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and if you fall in, your survival time is about 10 minutes. 
Not because you go into cardiac arrest, but because after 10 minutes your legs lock up and you tread water and you can't go tread water and you drown. Most of the time at the helm of the boat is spent in knee deep or even thigh deep one degree centigrade seawater and you lose feeling in your toes and the leather boots after seven or eight minutes. You've got to endure an hour in rough seas often at night where you don't see the storms coming. After an hour at the hole, you bang on the hatch and go into the space the size of a king-size double bed sitting on top of rocks. It's a cold, dangerous environment where your crewmates are being sick on you, you're sleeping in a steadily decomposing reindeer skin sleeping bag, and there's a third of an inch of wooden plank separating you from one degree centigrade of Southern Ocean. It ain't for everyone. How do you get through it? You break down the enormity of the mission down into manageable pieces and power through. If that's not a metaphor for how we approach a massive issue like climate change, I don't know what is. We had big, big storms on the Southern Ocean. We had a plan, and that plan changed almost immediately, as it always does in expeditions or in life. As the saying goes, all military strategy survives until contact with the enemy. Instead of sticking to the original plan to get to the South Ocean, we had to constantly change it according to what the weather put out. It reminds me how President Obama, in his second term in the Oval Office, had no majority in the House. He wanted to get climate change legislation through. So how could he do it? He had to, he had to be creative. He refurbished pre-existing air quality legislation in states he could control. It was clever. We got there eventually. It was a torturous journey. When we arrived in South Georgia and had evidently survived only just, three of my people were completely incapacitated due to the trials and tribulations of that journey. That left three people just like Shackleton had. A quick historical note on the men that made it to South Georgia. As the story goes, when they were on Elephant Island, Shackleton got the five best men, put them in a boat, and off they went to South Georgia. The rest, as they say, is history. But if you look more closely, that is not what happened. He took the three best people and the two biggest troublemakers in that boat. He didn't want to leave them behind to erode away the morale of the 22 men he'd left behind, leaving this precarious existence on the island. When it comes to climate change, sometimes you need to keep the people who represent the problem in close engagement. Instead of refusing to work with stakeholders you disagree with, the oil companies, the commercial polluters, the opposing political parties, you bring them into your inner circle. At least you can nullify the negative impact they have and try to get them to engage and help you positively. So off I went with the main two of my men. Enter the weather. We were unlucky. Antarctica can throw you 85 knot winds at you, which blew our tents away and destroyed everything. Everybody's looking at you as the leader saying, what do we do next? It can be very intimidating. It can be very overwhelming. I sometimes think there's a parallel between this situation and the day-to-day -day people are faced with dealing with an issue like climate change. Last two slides. In that situation, either getting cold, tired people to climb a mountain or doing something about global warming, a good adage is to do something. I found myself saying that we just need to do something, otherwise the wheels of the expedition were going to fall and all would be lost. And that's what we did. We headed into the mountains and we completed the journey. The good news is we can do something about climate change too. In addition to how you vote, you can reduce your personal footprint, you can put solar panels on your roof, and you can take public transport or cycle. Explorers have shared characteristics, vision, passion, the ability to instill confidence in others, and the resilience to see it through. We need to impact that kind of approach to, to others. Individuals need to do something. Collectively, we can all make a contribution. I'll leave the final word to Anita Roddick, who was the founder of The Body Shop. If you think being small can't make a difference, try going to sleep with a mosquito in the room. Okay, so this time instead of getting in groups of three or five or six, what I'd like you to do is just grab somebody next to you, and if it's two, you know, if there's, there's three of you, have a three, and I just want you to take a few minutes and ask yourself, what can we extract from this to apply to what we're doing? So how, what can we extract from their doing the impossible and surviving to what we're doing? So go ahead and take a few minutes and do that now. Yeah, how many people found it fascinating that he chose to take it to like 